Hey everyone, welcome to Foundation. I'm Kevin Rose. For more episodes with entrepreneurs, check out foundation.kr. Today we're talking to Ev Williams, who is the founder of Blogger. He's also the co-founder of Twitter and now founder and CEO of Medium. He's got some great stories. Let's chat with him. So let's start at the very beginning. Uh, where'd you grow up? I grew up on a farm, literally in the middle of cornfields outside a town called Clarks, Nebraska, which is in the middle of Nebraska, middle of the country. Um, very, very rural, rural, um, very tiny. No internet access on there. I mean, like, what did you have back then? <laughs> um, we had four digit phone numbers. And four digit phone numbers? Four digit I've phone numbers. I've never even heard of such a thing. Uh, yeah. It was, well, you know, every town had its own phone company, basically, okay. in, the, in the old days. And they, would, they, they were hooked into the long distance companies, but it only it only needed four digits to have everybody in town and but there's only so many circuits so you had like five minutes to talk until it would beep and give you one minute warning maybe it gave you a one minute warning at four and then it would just cut you off at the next time that's insane and then you'd call back um well, did you have to wait yeah. in a queue in order to get back in or was it sometimes like Sometimes. That's so yeah. crazy. So how did you even have internet access out there? Did they have a dial up? Or Later. you could only get on the well, net this like four was, this minutes was like, time? Yeah, that's what Like when you were a little kid. This was when I was little. Yeah. And then um, they upgraded that. But yeah, they didn't really have internet until uh, till later. Now they, now they got the DSL even yeah. on the farm. So I mean, you grew up on a farm. <clears throat> Obviously, I'm assuming there was like no computers in the house, like just like farm life. Actually, there was. When I was pretty young, probably, um, 15 or less, my dad got a computer for the farm. And, and he was he had a fairly large farm and he was an early adopter and he got it like an IBM 8088 processor, DOS I have based the same thing. machine. I had an 8088. Yeah. And it was very exciting. And he used it, you know, he had these proprietary farm applications that he bought from whatever farm salesman. Bill. and. Uh, you know, he used it to, to track stuff. And I was very excited and I literally read the manual, which made no sense to me. Of the computer or of, of the, of the of, farm application. Of the computer. Okay. To try to figure, like, how do I do more? How do I, That's like, so crazy. I did in. the exact really? same thing with DOS, I swear. Yeah. I learned every, I saw the DOS commands. I was like going through every one, just trying right. them out to see what they did. Yeah, yeah. And then when I was a sophomore in high school, we had computers at school even though it was a tiny school, and we learned programming, basic programming, mm -hmm. and I was mind blown. It was the best thing I'd ever done. Mm -hmm. I was super good at it. The teacher was a real slacker and didn't really care, so I ended up like teaching half the class and awesome. doing 10 times more than I was needed to for the final project, and it was like, I would literally, I would be programming on, on these computers, and everybody would leave the school and they'd shut the lights off and, and I would just be there and I'd, I'd look around and I was in the middle of the school by myself. And that's when I was like, that's when I really saw the light. Yeah. I didn't know how to then go home and make the IBM do what the Apple did at school. Oh, so it was Apple's at school? Yeah, it was Apple, okay. Apple twos. Um, so that was, that was the dawning when I was like a sophomore in high school. Mm -hmm. And so did you stay there for a while? I mean, did you go off to college? I left, my parents got divorced, I ended up moving my senior year of high school to what seemed like a metropolis of 20,000 people, 30, 30 miles down the road. Uh, and then the next year went to University of Nebraska. So it was this gradual upstep of, of size um, and, and environment. So I went to University of Nebraska in Lincoln, which is um, you know, a nice town, state capital, college town. I went mostly because I didn't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my whole family had gone to, to the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And I was like, and I, I didn't really want to go to school. I was like, I, I knew I wanted to, I always wanted to start companies. I always wanted to be independent. I wanted to do my own thing. And computer companies back then or just like a No, new? it wasn't that clear. I didn't, I didn't know that. I mean, I wanted to do everything from when I was a lot younger, I was totally into to BMX and skateboarding. I was like, I'm gonna start a bike shop or, or mm -hmm. whatever it is. So I just wanted to make stuff and have companies. Hey, so did you watch the movie Rad? You remember that? Yeah. BMXing? That was yeah, such a good awesome. movie. Yeah. 
<laughs> I would get the the BMX and later freestyle magazines. I was I was a freak in my times. I was into these things that literally no one else was right. into, which is hard to. It's it's an interesting corollary to being um, a internet person in Silicon Valley, especially back then. But I was always like into these things. I started my first internet company to fast forward a little bit in '93, but I was in Lincoln, and again, it's like no one knew what the hell I was talking about. So, but, how did you first get on the internet? Like, what was the uh, the very first? Were you bulletin boards before that, or bulletin, did some bulletin boards and did like I think the very first online experience was probably Prodigy, mm -hmm. which came with a computer that I bought like on credit when I was in college, and uh, that was pretty cool. And then I I may have experienced bulletin boards bef before that, ex but I did them sporadically. And for a while, I lived back on the farm after college. I was getting into bulletin boards more, but it was long distance calls of everything. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that was expensive. And then I set up my own, but didn't really build it out. And, but shortly after that, so there was a brief, uh, brief period in there where it was AOL, CompuServe, probably spent more time on CompuServe. Mm -hmm and then uh, and bulletin boards before or figured out how to just get on, get the, on the internet. internet. Right. Yeah. There was that weird period where you, yeah. you kind of thought those were the internet, but yeah. they weren't, and then yeah. there was this browser thing. And then there was and gateways to the internet, yeah, and then totally. there was like, and then it was uh, getting slip access or, uh, right. yeah. And that's when I started creating my first internet product, which was this how to use the internet video. After I had it all figured out, I was like, we can teach people how to get it on the internet because it's really not clear. So you made VHS tapes? Made VHS tapes, yeah. Nice. Absolutely. Self produced. Did you sell those then? Yeah. Yeah. Do you still have one somewhere? We gotta roll that at the end of this video. Uh, we can we can maybe add a little clip in here. It's uh, I've gotten over the embarrassment a little bit, but for like a decade I was fearing it was gonna be placed on the internet. Cause it's <laughs> It's about the worst thing you've ever seen. But Amazing. hilarious. Are you in front of the camera? Oh, yeah. Like, this Absolutely. is how you use the Absolutely. internet. There's a little clip on my website uh, that I put on YouTube a while back. And um, it's, it was like two hours long. And me and a friend, it was self-produced, literally in a basement. And it was command line. It was like that period before you could really get right. a, a graphical connection. So it was cut between myself talking, myself and my friend talking, and like, here's FTP. FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol. And cut to the screen, FTP, like, <laughs> you know, just horrible. And then, and then I did some 3D graphics in between. They're pretty hot. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. Still cutting edge 3D <laughs> graphics oh, back yeah. then. Absolutely. That's crazy. So you, now, just going back to college real quick, did you study computer science mm. in college or was there no computer science? There was computer science, um, or computers anyway. I don't mm -hmm. know if it was science. Um, and I took a class, but I, very, I didn't take college seriously at all. So I didn't. You graduated though. No. No, you didn't. I didn't. Nice no. fellow dropout. I, uh, I took classes, well, I was enrolled for two years technically. I took classes for the first year. I went to the first week of classes uh, both semesters of my second year just so I could get the student loan money. Uh, but I literally, I just stopped going and dropped out. Yeah, it sounds pretty much about the same path that I took as yeah. well. So um, your first internet company, what was, what was that? Not the videos, but... Well, I, I bummed around a lot, like trying to figure out what I was doing and thinking up one, one scheme or another. And uh, this was still... I'm a lot older than you, so I went to You're college in, in 90, nine, yeah, 90, so. In, in 90? Yeah. Wow. Um, and so this was, this is pre-internet for real, and then, um, so I was like, I was into like publishing and self-publishing and like mail order and trying to like sketchy schemes like that, trying to figure out. And nothing really came of that. Oh, CD-ROMs. I mean, there, there was the period before the internet was the next big thing when CD-ROMs multimedia were, mm -hmm. were the... Absolutely. That was the big thing. And so I started a company actually with my dad and my brother joined for a while and we were gonna make CD-ROMs. And we made one, which 
my brother actually led this project, but he made a multimedia encyclopedia of Husker football. So being from Nebraska, that was about the biggest, coolest thing you could, you could do. I was never that into football, but he was, and he got a license from the university and made a CD-ROM with videos and pictures and all this information. Mm -hmm. And, and you bought a CD burner? Yeah. Which back then was really expensive. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we got like, we got a real packaging made and everything, and mm -hmm. it actually, it was definitely a step above the how to use the internet video, although it was, it was almost the same time. He was working on that, and I was working on the, the video. Um, but he sold it in stores and stuff. Turned out the overlap of people, Nebraska football fans in 93 and CD-ROM owners wasn't <laughs> that high. Um, so you so, sold like 50 copies or yeah, something? Yeah, it, it may have broke even on a very low budget, but he had a lot of those in his, in his garage for a long time. Uh, but that was, that was kind of the first company. It segued into the internet company, first the video, and then, um, and then just trying to, it, when I think back on it, it, it actually seemed logical to be an internet company. It was like the internet was narrow enough or we didn't know what it was, you could be an internet company. And we had all these ideas and I, I kind of recruited some friends and um, we just thought of ideas, but we didn't really know how to write software, mm -hmm. which was a drawback. We taught ourselves how to write HTML and create websites mm -hmm. and then eventually you know, data-backed websites, and so we could create dynamic uh, web applications, sort I feel of. Like everybody did that initially. Everyone had their own little web design shop. Yes. And then yeah. I used like front page server extensions to like totally. do some database some kind of, of stuff. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, and then I, from there, it kind of got into ASP, which I actually right. used for a while. The first version of Blogger was an ASP, actually. But way back then, still in Nebraska, when it, because we couldn't, we had these ideas for the you know, same ideas as everybody else, like what the internet could be, it'd be we could put yellow pages on here or um, whatever it was. And, but not really knowing how to create that, knowing how to build websites, we ended up being a web development shop. Mm -hmm. We needed to get money. So services business, how do we get money? For some reason, it seemed we, we spent our time trying to sell local businesses uh, instead of just like finding anyone on in the world, right. but so we we're trying to sell like this restaurant, and we'd sometimes register their domain name, um, say, "Hey, we got you know." We never hold it hostage from them, but say, right. "Hey, we can set you up." And just that, domains were expensive back then. Do you remember they were like fifty dollars a pop? You'd have to get them. From yeah. Like... Well, at the very beginning, they were free. I right. remember when they were free. Right. And you could, and I remember literally checking command lines, like available, like just typing in words, and they were available. And I was like, ah, but I have to send an email to get it, and so I didn't bother with right. any of those. But but some I registered and did these, you know, really, you know, very basic websites for small businesses and. Just hated. It. I hated the sales. Was bad at the service. Mm -hmm. Didn't care about the projects. It's like, and eventually, like this isn't fun at all. Yeah, services business, like servicing other small businesses, was like something I think everybody tried back then. Yeah. And it ended up being a nightmare. Yeah. So how did you like eventually? So Blogger was like your first, obviously, big hit. Mm -hmm. And and what were what year was that when you first kind of started coming up with that? So, I messed around with that company in Nebraska, a million different ideas, painful experience, but very educational. I'd never worked in a company. I started my own company, did all these projects, eventually lost enough of my dad's money and went through enough stress that I shut that down in like 96. Mm -hmm. I was still in Nebraska. And then I just on my own built some websites for some clients and for about a year and that came out here in 97. So finally, California is the place to be if, if you're in the internet. Just because you heard like a lot of stuff going on out here? Like Yeah, I mean I was, by that time we had the web and I would like voraciously mm -hmm. read the news about the industry and of course a lot of it was still magazines then, that's how we, and so I'd subscribed all the magazines and this is where things were happening. It helped that I had a, a girlfriend who moved out like six months before I did because mm -hmm. she, she got a job with an internet company in Lincoln who was, also had an office out here and they moved her out. And we had broken up, but it gave me a glimpse. I had never even been to California. 
and uh, but I helped her move out, and then I saw this is possible. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have any money at that time, so I started looking for a job, basically my first professional job ever to get me out here, and ended up finding one at O'Reilly, um, now called O'Reilly Media. At the time, O'Reilly and Associates, um, and that was why I ended up in Sebastopol, which for those who don't know, it was about an hour north of, the, of San Francisco in a tiny town. Yeah, another really small town. Yeah. From Nebraska, Sebastopol looks approximately like you know, San Francisco. It's, it's very close, but uh, once I got here, I realized I was a little bit far right. away from the action. Uh, but O'Reilly was a great company. I was lucky to have landed there and ended up being important later, the connections and mm -hmm. relationships I made there. And Tim was always a supporter, so that was good. But I didn't stay there very long. Um, came after O'Reilly. I wanted to be closer to the action. I got ended up going to South Bay actually, and I was just doing. I'd learned enough programming then, and there was enough demand to actually get a job um, contract, doing contract development for mm -hmm. like uh, HP and Intel and these big companies. I would hire these consulting firms. Mm -hmm. They just need more bodies to like build these internet applications, and they were using ASP and Microsoft stuff, and I'd be like. I could do this, and that was paying the bills. That was like the most I'd ever been paid in my life. I was in, at first first contract. I was making fifty dollars an hour, and then the next one I was making eighty five dollars an hour. I was mm -hmm. like, "Holy smokes, yeah. eighty five dollars an hour! What <laughs> yeah. am I going to do with all this money?" Uh, but of course, I hated it. Still, I liked the I liked the development. I just you know I was working on projects I didn't care about. Right. But I was kind of building up my stamina again to say, okay, I'm ready to start something. Mm -hmm. And then that ended up being Blogger. Well, it was Pyra, became Blogger later. What, what was it about that moment in time? Like, were people blogging at that point? Well, were people writing their own personal? Very, very little. So this is, this is in 99, and I had had a personal website since 96, like a lot of people who, you know, what do you do with a personal website? You, you, you work on your HTML skills and mm -hmm. you put up different pages and sure. you link them together and you put photos and I did a little bit of writing. But uh, I, a huge inspiration early on was Dave Weiner. I, mean, I read Scripting News and um, you know a small community of people who did stuff like that. And what we were learning was becoming this native form of the web. It was sort of a discovery process. but but. It, it got a name as a web blog, and mm -hmm. um, so there was a few people, and so myself and Meg Horahan and Paul Bausch, who were the company at the time, we weren't intending to do anything along those lines, but we all had personal websites, and we were all big web geeks, so we converted our own sites into web blogs, and a web blog was just essentially uh, a, a way to like have a, a a form basically that you could submit in content. It and wasn't just even auto publish it, or that wasn't even part of the definition at first. A lot of people hand coded their web logs. It was the original name came from the idea that it's a log of sites I visit on the internet. So it was a very uh, specific use case mm -hmm. of I'm going to comment about and point to other sites, mm -hmm. and so it was a way to discover sites and web pages and but the common thing was it was chronological and um, you know reverse chronological and that was about it and that was what a weblog was and then it was distinct from journals which looked pretty similar but were about your personal you know online diaries mm -hmm. and and then it started the forms started blending a little bit and uh, when we and there was one or one actual web blog application that I knew of before we started Blogger, besides Dave stuff, which um, had a little bit different form at the time, but there was a site called PETAs. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. that, but it, PETAs was um, enter, enter a title, enter a URL, your description, and it was hosted, and you just hosted web blog. And, but, so I, I wanted to convert my site, evhead.com, into this form, and I just wrote a script to do it because I was a web developer, and then, and that was one of the big epiphanies, like, oh, 
this completely changes the nature of web publishing for me as a person because I can now have a thought and in two seconds it's on the web. That's new and interesting. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of planted the seed of what eventually became Blogger. Mm -hmm. And how did you come up with the name <laughs> Blogger? Well, it's funny because Blogger, when we came up with it, was not a generic term at all. It, people used the term weblog, it was a tiny community, people were, and people may even have used the term weblogger as someone who, who does this. And I just, I actually was trying to think of a brandable name for an application that would do this, and it was just like playing with words, and one of the techniques would be to, like, to chop off the first syllable of a word, like I would call a computer a pooter, you know, for fun. <laughs> and uh, so I was like, oh, that was part of it. The other part was Peter Merholtz um, said, we should, instead of pronouncing it weblog, we should pronounce it we blog. Uh, so he actually coined the term blog. And um, I think somewhat tongue in cheek. And so that, and like, it was just brainstorming names. I, blog, blogger, that's our thing. Registeredblogger.com. It was just free. Yeah, yeah, it was just available. Grabbed it, uh, and. I miss those days. I know. <laughs> you can just go and grab anything yeah. you want. Yeah. And so, um, and then that's you know, where it came from. We launched it in August 1999, completely as a side project, as a, a hack, basically one week hack, by, um, when we were really doing this other more serious thing, which was this project management tracking thing with that. Well, let's do this little thing on the side. Mm -hmm. And then that just obviously, <clears throat> was it, you know, it's funny, I feel like from an outsider looking in, almost all the services that you've been involved with have taken time to get traction. Mm -hmm. Like for Twitter, sure. for example, yeah. from like many, many months. Yep. Um, how long did it take before this one, before Blogger really took off? Well, it's, the, the scale was so much different then, yeah. right? Because by today's standards, right. it's, it never did. I mean, at least until it got to Google and got to tens of millions. But um, even when I sold to Google, there was maybe a million blogs on Blogger, which seemed like a big number, and today is just such a tiny right. number. So, <clears throat> and it was, I think it was very gradual, but it seemed fast. Um, and, and there were ups and downs, but we immediately got attention from this community that you know, was into blogging, and we were just blown away. We started getting press, and we started, and... And you were hosting this all yourself. You had running on your own servers? Yeah, well, yeah, the app we did. Um, Blogger, for the first year, was so geeky that you had to have your own server and put in FTP settings because we would generate the page with Blogger and then FTP it to your server. Mm -hmm. That was like our big idea because we were such geeks that we thought, well, that will give anyone, you know, everyone wants their own server and their own domain and wants to completely control the design right. and this will give them ultimate flexibility because we're just putting a file on their server. They could combine that with other code. They could do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Like that was the the idea so for the entire first year you had to go get hosting if you didn't have it already um you know geocities had you could you could put it on geocities you could put it anywhere <laughs> geocities. and uh it's crazy <laughs> i haven't heard that name in a while yeah and 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 we would ftp the file over so we were hosting this app and it would do the you know the the logic, and then every time you updated something, we, we had a database of all your posts, and we you could change the template, and we'd generate the files and put them over on your server. A year later, we started uh, Blogspot, and we called it blogspot.com. That's where the hosted blogs were, because we were worried about what we called the GeoCities effect, actually because we were, we were snobs, and we, we thought, well, all the good professional stuff is gonna be people who have their own domains and know mm -hmm. what they're doing, um, and we wanna make it easier for those who don't. <clears throat> this, is, this is completely wrong thinking, I now realize, but we thought all the stuff that is super easy, that's gonna be the crap, and if we put that on Blogger, Blogger is gonna be associated with all that crap, mm. and we're not gonna get the good stuff. 
And that's why it was Blogspot. And we even had the idea that maybe there's different hosts. Maybe, and we, we were reluctant even to become a host. And we thought, well, maybe we'll plug in different hosts. But we just, and of course, that's, I mean, back to your question, that's when it started to take off. Mm -hmm. When you didn't have to do this ludicrous, right. geeky setup. it wasn't setup. a four day sign up process. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> At that point, you could choose a domain name on Blogspot and start posting your thoughts. Mm -hmm. and that then then we just saw it, it by our account skyrocket and we started i started getting familiar with uh scaling problems mm -hmm. which have been you know uh, with me most <laughs> most of the years since so uh you were all self-funded did you take any money when we when did you? take money we were self-funded for a year we were actually contracting stuff the side on Right before starting Pyra, I was contracting it at HP, kept that contract, converted it to the company so any of us could do it. So we had three of us in the company, and basically one person working on, we'd kind of alternate, would pay the bills for all of us. So that was the first year of Pyra. And then after we launched Blogger, we raised $500,000 right before the dot-com crash. Actually, we technically closed after the stock market crash. And we raised $500,000 from O'Reilly um, and uh, Condé Nast parent company Advance. And so these publishers, it was weird. I didn't really realize at the time, but they were, these were basically strategic investors. Mm -hmm. they're, they're in the publishing world and they, they were interested in Blogger and then a few angels. And $500,000 was the most money I could ever imagine needing to do anything. Uh, so we, we ramped that up. That, took us less than a year. Um, fortunately, it was only $500,000, which meant we didn't get crazy with the team or the cost or anything. Mm -hmm. We ramped up to seven people at the peak. Uh, but then the air was really out of the bubble by the end of that year when we were running out of that money. And that's when things went less fun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, talk to me about <laughs> raising your first round of funding. You know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there that are watching this mm -hmm. that like, you know, I know for me, you know, we don't, have business degrees, you, know, mm -hmm. you drop out of college and mm -hmm. you're like going into this meeting. What, what was that like? Was it was it a scary process for you? Or I guess you knew yeah. O'Reilly already, so that I, wasn't well, so bad. No, but it was totally a scary process. And I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I feel like today there's so much information out there about how to do it, what it means, what all these terms mean, value it. I mean, there's, people are way more sophisticated now just because of the, of the information on blogs that you can read. And uh, so I had no idea. What I, I don't even think we purposely set out to raise money. It was nice that we weren't, it, that wasn't a blocker for us. We were doing things anyway. So um, I don't know if I asked for the meeting or they did, but I started by talking to O'Reilly or someone at O'Reilly, I think Dale Doherty, Mark Jacobson, who was heading investments for them, and, and met with Tim at some point. And they reached out, kind of curious about what we were doing, or maybe I reached out. But anyway, it just kind of happened. They're just kind of, well, you know, we can invest. And there was no pitch. I had no pitch deck. Um, there, was, there was another guy who was really key for us, which was Jerry Mikulski, who emailed me out of the blue and said, who are you guys? What are you doing? And it turned out he was, um, he was connected to everybody. So he mm -hmm. introduced us to some other people. Um, he so you had a lot of inbound interest, basically, from yeah. the traction that was happening yeah. in service at the time. Exactly. And, and that's the same thing with Condé Nast, which blew my mind. Like, uh, Jeff Jarvis, actually, mm -hmm. who uh, was there at the time, leading a bunch of their internet stuff, loved Blogger, and called, called us up. It's like, how can we work together? And, you know, the, the subject of money came up and I was like, well, we're raising money. And I'm like, we'll put in money. And so, and Jerry put in money. And there was this, there, I remember one particular conversation with, with Jerry and Mark Jacobson from O'Reilly about valuation. And I, had, I don't know where I got it, but we were raising $500,000. I thought um, maybe I asked for, for, two and a half million pre, and they said one and a half, and we landed on two. And it was like a three minute conversation, and that was it. And then I just 
got all the docs from their lawyers, and mm -hmm. it did, you know, there was no getting negotiated. It was all their deal. lawyers. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. We, I had a lawyer, but I didn't remember, like, we weren't sophisticated about, I don't think I had a good lawyer at the time, we weren't sophisticated about the terms or anything. It right. But they were friendly investors, and, you know, O'Reilly, thankfully, it, it was them, so it all worked out. That was it. Yeah. And then we had $500,000, and it was like, holy shit, we got $500,000. Um, that was pretty great. And then when you fast forward to, to you know, you'd, you'd built the business up, you were scaling Blogger, at some point in time, I guess you had an option of either raising more money or selling to Google. Yeah, so there's a lot in between there. So um, the, the, the short version is we ran out of that money, the $500,000. Then there was no money around. This is the end of 2000. Right. And then it was panic mode. And after considering a couple terrible acquisitions, um, one to, to Nick Denton's moreover, uh, which came close to happening and thankfully didn't, uh, then basically I told the team, we're done. We can't pay you anymore. I'm gonna keep working. Wow, that's crazy. I didn't know yeah. you were almost like gonna hang it up. Yeah, and it was very close. And we, we were really out of money. I mean, the team all worked like two weeks past what we had payroll for. Um, but you were still growing, right, at that point? Yeah, it was this weird time because you could be somewhat successful on the, on the product side, but it was consumer app. And right. is, that did not get you money momentum right. on the consumer side. So because they'd all just blown up on the yeah, stock market. And exactly. Was like, I'm not touching that. Exactly. Yeah. And so and even our, our investors at the time were like, we're out. Um, O'Reilly was wasn't going to put in more money, but they they were still supporting us. But yeah, so it was the product still growing. And so there was a point January 2001 where we did the server drive. And this was something a lot of the smaller uh, internet companies were doing. It was basically, hey, we don't have any more money. Users, will you give us some? And it, I kind of hated that idea because it felt just, I, I just didn't like it. It felt like begging. It, was like, it felt like groveling. It was like, we, we can make this work. But, but I decided I was OK with it if we said, if it was an, actually an exchange. I didn't want them giving me money to like, pay my rent. Um, but so we call this server drive. It's like, we need more servers. Blogger's getting slow, we need more servers. You want Blogger to be faster, give money. We'll use that money only to buy more servers. Mm -hmm. So we did this call for donations, in, and we were hoping to buy like one server, and we had maybe four. So <laughs> this, that, that would have been a huge deal to get like one $4,000 server. Mm -hmm. And we got $14,000 from users. And so we bought like three or four servers, um, one whole one from, from CMP, who ran Web Techniques Magazine. And so we got all this goodwill and community support. Uh, so at the same, the same month that I laid off the whole team. And so it was, <laughs> and then the next day after laying off the whole team, I came back to work and kept running the site. And then at what point did, did Google call? So two years later, is when we sold. And in Did between, you eventually hire people back in? Yeah, so I built up the team. The first year was mostly me. Uh, Jason Schellen uh, started working with me later that year and more on the business side, and then um, started hiring other, other people, developers and, and design support. And we, we were six people when we sold. So, but all those, other than me, they're completely different people than the first team. Mm -hmm. And, um, there was a time, so the end of 2002 is when things were going much better. Completely bootstrapped by launching paid services for users. Um, and we were on roll, the market was back a little bit, blogs were getting more attention, and uh, Joey Ito came around and said he wanted to invest. And we, that was another time, it sort of just came to us. And at the time, things were looking good, and we negotiated uh, basically the exact same terms as the two years before when I'd raised the $500,000. Um, he offered to put in a million dollars, and um, we were going to do that. 
And then basically the next day, Google called. And um, so that was the deal that was on the table then. Either we go to Google or we raise money. So um, that was a very hard decision, but. What was it, it like? Uh, most people haven't gone through this process. What was it like negotiating with Google? Like all these things at the time, I had no idea what I was doing. And thankfully, I had some people who did. And so the, our very first meeting at Google, we went down. They had called us up. You know how acquisitions are always euphemistically phrased in the beginning. Like right. they, they don't call you up and like say, we want to buy your company. Bit, it's yeah. like, would you be interested in working together? Or maybe we could explore partnership opportunities. Right. And I'm like, partnering with Google, that sounds great. So we like have a meeting. And we're, so you had no idea it was going to be acquisition? No idea. You're just like, no I'm going to go there and chat. And, uh, <clears throat> and because Google was a search company. So why would, like, so they, they hadn't acquired any companies at all. They had acquired some assets. And, and they're a search company. So it was like, didn't even occur to us. And we didn't know what we were doing. So for all these reasons, when they say partner, we're like, oh, well, it's Google. And, uh, so we went down at our very first meeting. I think it was Jason and I and uh, Mark and Dale from O'Reilly, and we sit down with with some of the corp dev people and David Drummond, and we're like, oh, so we're thinking about partnering. Maybe you want to search the blogs, or we can put the search on on Blogger, and and they're like, yeah, all those things sound interesting, but you know, we're Google, we're hundreds of people and you're six people, so partnering doesn't really make that much sense, but maybe you want to just come and run Blogger from here, like be part of Google. Mm. I was like, in that, like David Drummond said that, and I was like, oh, interesting. <laughs> and so that, that was about it for that meeting. It was like, well, Google wants to buy us? That's, what, what does that mean? And, so then the negotiating didn't come. We engaged, obviously. Um, they started giving us offers, which were terrible as far as we saw it. Google was still a private company. Mm -hmm. So it was it was you know stock deal. We had to believe their valuation. Oh, interesting. It was all stock deal. It, all stock deal. I was wanted to negotiate for some cash. Thankfully, I never did. But um, Mark from O'Reilly and then Tim eventually got involved. Like at the very last minute, like we were going back and forth, and they did a thing that um, you know a lot of a lot of uh, people face. They like they want to put most of it on the team because it's um, mostly I don't know. It was mostly a talent deal, I guess. And um, so eventually, Tim and Mark from O'Reilly really helped, and they did did they did the heavy hitting negotiation. Yeah. Crazy, and so you joined Google and, and were there for how many years? I was there for just under two years. What, what was that experience like for you? I mean, <clears throat> you know, you'd only worked in a team of like four or five people. Yeah. Uh, it was, I, yeah, I was, I regret a little bit that I didn't stay for longer and I didn't try harder to f learn that world because I was a fish out of water, absolutely. We, our first day at Google, we actually had an office here in downtown San Francisco where the six of us, we wouldn't work there every day, but it was, it was like a conference room size office. Mm -hmm. Our first day at Google was they literally put the six of us in a conference room, except it had no windows, unlike our office down here. And so, and we weren't supposed to tell anybody we were there, even Googlers. They hadn't announced it yet. <laughs> no, they hadn't announced it and they didn't want it to leak. And so it was very surreal. It was like we just moved our office inside this other company. Hmm. We've had no real discussion about why we're there. And I think when you're on the outside of deals, you know, there's always speculation about why a company did this. And there's, there's way more strategy outside of companies than there is inside the company about the same company. Right. You know? Yeah, <laughs> totally. Like, and uh, so we were the same way. It was like, we assume we're part of some master plan, right? And we're gonna we're gonna be called into a room very soon with like Larry and Sergey and Eric, and we're gonna be told what our master plan is. Mm -hmm. What is it, what is our piece of the puzzle? But that never happened. We were just I mean, eventually I why just did they want realized, you guys then? Eventually I realized it was it was a trivial deal for them. They decided it was maybe time to do some acquisitions and do new things, and they liked us and like like. 
And even AdSense, a lot of people once they saw it said, oh, it's for AdSense. But that wasn't their strategy with AdSense, to own the, the sites. It happened to be coincidental that right after we got there, they were starting to pilot AdSense, mm -hmm. and we had, on the blogs we hosted, we had ads, and we're like, can we swap out those crappy banners for AdSense? Synergy, right. nice. Right. That wasn't why they did the deal. And so, hard, hard to say. I mean, I, I don't know. I was never really told, uh, but, did I mean, you get to experience any of the creativity like there in, internally? Like, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on like, just how they innovate versus how a startup innovates. Um, well, I, I learned a lot. I thought a lot about that while I was there. I think it's a very different company today. But we, I was basically employee number 800 at Google. So to me, it was a huge company. Compared to the Google you know today, 55,000. It was. 000. It was <laughs> It was a tiny tadpole. And it was all about search and advertising. And, but the thing I did realize very early on, so at the time, I think if you were in the internet, you, you feared Google. I mean, there was a time where, anytime you go to raise money around those few years, the question was, well, what if Google does this? I mean, they were just this formidable, scary right. power. Right infallible and Microsoft used to be that way before Google it was like, right. what if Microsoft does this right. you're, you're gonna be screwed right. yeah and once I got there I realized why that was just not true and not because they weren't good it's just it didn't make sense for them to do a anything that wasn't really big and B they just have they just have other priorities and so my huge frustration while I was there was you know, I was basically having bootstrapped most of the four years I was running Blogger independently, I was just starving for resources. I had, you know, like any time that you've been working on something for a while, you have years worth of feature development, product development right. in your mind and on paper. It's like, oh, we're gonna do all this stuff. And I was literally, the choice was, we raise money so I can hire a team or we go to Google and I naively thought I'm gonna get engineers and resources to build that they all stuff. Give you more people. Well, it's it. They did eventually and slowly, but it wasn't. <laughs> it was understandable once I understood their world, which was we're super picky about who we hire. Therefore, you can't just go hire janky engineers on your own and call them Google engineers. So they have to come through a regular hiring process. Mm -hmm. Every person that gets through this this gauntlet is a Google engineer and we're gonna apply them in the highest priority Google projects. So you have these rocket ships of Google web search mm -hmm. and AdSense, to fight for all talent. of whom are starving for resources. And then you have Blogger and it was like, even I couldn't make a credible argument why any particular engineer should go to Blogger right. instead of this thing that is the critical thing for the company. So it was a bit of a dilemma, and, but it demonstrated to me why when a company's in that mode, they can't even afford to invest much in speculative ideas. And then as I started talking to them about Blogger and where Blogger was going, I saw a mindset that was mostly about, <clears throat> if you look at what, what Google has kicked ass on, it's known problems that mm -hmm. they come up with a better solution like for. Like a it. technical solution for yeah. it. Yeah. And so the qu start type of questions I started getting were, you know, how, how big is this blogging market and how much of it do we own? <coughs> Which just wasn't a way I thought at all because I just felt this was an emerging thing and if we make it easier and more expressive and build these cool features, then more people are gonna do it. Mm -hmm. And that, so there was a complete disconnect and that's the way any really new thing you have to, you can't look at the size of the market. We didn't look at the size of the Twitter market before, you know, like, you know, we have a better right. twi Twitter algorithm. Yeah. And so it's, it's kind of classic innovator's dilemma stuff, but it's also a particular sort of computer science-y approach to, mm -hmm. to business, which is what, they, what they've succeeded at historically have been these known things that they can do smarter than anybody else. Do you think that that's part of the reason why they've never really hit it out of the park so far on social? Like it feels to me like 
there's not a problem there that they can really wrap their heads around. Like, you know, that they yeah. need to technically solve. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, I think that makes sense as part of it. And I think it's probably a variety of factors. It's, the problem is not straightforward. It right. Is, is that it's the social, it's, it's a people, it's user experience, it's, it's not an engineering problem. Mm -hmm. uh, Gmail was, well, I think, one of their best products, one of the best products on the internet, and was one of the last ones where, though, other than acquisitions, my analysis would be part of the reason that was so great was because it was basically a founder-driven product, Paul mm -hmm. Bukite being the guy internally who had a vision, and he didn't have to, he did it early enough in Google that he didn't have to defend that vision to anybody, he could just build it, and I think it turned out much more interesting than say, uh, you know, Docs or some of these other things, which are solid products, but are basically duplications of what existed before. Right. And they're not huge leaps forward yet. Right. So let's jump forward to, to Twitter. Um, cover that real quick, and then I want to spend a, bu a little bit of time on, on, on Medium. But, sure. Uh, I mean, people have talked about the story of Twitter for, obviously it's been covered in the press. We don't have to go rehash mm -hmm. all of that. But, um, you know, what was, now that you can look back on things, and you're still on the board, right? I am, yeah. Um, what do you think, why, why was Twitter so successful in the very early days? And, and like, I feel that a lot of companies look at Twitter and they say, like Pinterest and others, it took six, eight, 12 months before it actually started to take off. Mm -hmm. In today's kind of like um, world, I feel that a lot of companies pivot to another idea, like well mm -hmm. before that. You wait uh, like two months and if things don't right. take off, you're onto something else. Yep. Like, do you think that's a, that's a big problem with today's current startups? I think it can be, for sure. I, I've, I've lamented this a lot. I've been invested in companies that I love the idea of, and a few months down the road, they're like, ah, it's not working, we're gonna do completely something different. And you're like, wait, wait, like, give yeah, it some more like, time. This, and, the, and the new thing is sort of like a trivial idea, but it gets traction, and they're, they're stoked, and that's fine. They're adding some value if that's working, but I was disappointed because it, maybe this other idea wouldn't have ever worked, but you didn't explore that, mm -hmm. and it was such a big idea. And it, you can't, it's, I, the way I like to do things is, is like just, any big idea is going to take a while to get there. I mean, it's, by definition, if it's big and no one's done it before, it's not going to be one, two, three, we got it. it there's going to be a, a dark period in there because you don't know what the key to getting there is. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of any really big thing that just came out and started growing immediately and, and worked. Um, maybe YouTube is the exception to that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I think you have to just, you don't know what it is necessarily. But I think you have to like have a direction that you really want to explore. And you have to be willing to just be in some murky territory while, while going in that direction and you know, be prepared to invest if you really want to do something different. Mm -hmm. What was it that you learned over time in building these companies? Like I feel like Twitter was an example where you know you were CEO, you weren't. Jack mm -hmm. was CEO, then he wasn't. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, this was the first company we actually you grew to a certain scale. Like yeah. this was the the big, first big big hit that you had. Totally. Um, what are some learnings there? Oh gosh, there's there's a million. It, Twitter was a a crazy ride. Um, I. I had come out off of it from Odeo, which I was running, and that wasn't a great experience for me. I, um, obviously, super happy that happened because that led to Twitter, but Odeo, I raised money prematurely, probably too much. I think I was a little bit too eager to, to get success number two after mm -hmm. Blogger, and I kind of got pulled into that company. I didn't actually start it at first, and I got pulled in, and then, it was a lot of inbound you know, hype and money and stuff. And then, so it was kind of a slog for 18 months or so until I bought my way out of it, basically. And uh, I won. That's right, you paid back all the investors there. Yeah, yeah, I, I, 
I bought the company basically. We were going to sh shut it down. It wasn't going great. Looked for a buyer, couldn't find a buyer, and I just said, I'll just, I'll just make everybody whole and take this stuff and like do it a like smaller scale, more freedom, more like just like get out of this this situation I'm in. Like the the VC back CEO, mm -hmm. the company is not going great, and a dozen employees. That wasn't fun. So that's so when we when Twitter start did start to take off. Um, which is about six months after that, I was like, Jack, you, you've been running the project within Obvious 1.0 at the time. And uh, so, you know, he, he had never even, he was an engineer who, who was, um, and I just said, like, go for it. And I'll, I'll be here if you need help. Mm -hmm. And I did, just didn't want to do it for a while. Um, and then, and then it just became more than any of us were prepared for. Um, and, you know, like, so he, he was CEO for that first, first year and a half of being an independent company. And then I took over as CEO for two years. And then it was, it was just, um, then Dick's now been CEO for, for uh, a little over two years. Mm -hmm. It's been CEO longest of any of us. I just That's know. crazy. So what was the, uh, you know, for me at, at DIG, we ran into scaling issues and, you know, it was like, initially we hired for a very sp specific, like, PHP developer. Mm -hmm. And then when PHP was no longer the solution, that didn't <coughs> scale. And so mm -hmm. we had to, we had to mm -hmm. change that out and hire for a more generalist type of developer. Yeah. Like, do you feel that there was, like, what were some of the scaling problems that you ran into and, like, yeah. how did you get around this? Because I know initially we were all Rails and then you had issues there and yeah. it's like, it, it was that that was a bane of my existence for for a long time. It was was the scaling issues, and it killed me because I didn't know the answer. And so when you're one level removed from actually being able to get there in there and figure it out yourself, mm -hmm. and you have smart people who you trust telling you different things, it's really hard to know what yeah. to do. And uh, and because there is no right answer is, is the truth of these things. And people would totally simplify and say, well, you know, from the outside all the time, like Rails sucks. You guys don't know what you do and you're idiots. Right. And, but very smart people say that's silly. It's, it's about the architecture, not the language. Mm -hmm. and, and Rails out of the box architecture is not built to scale. You know, it's a trade off for, for fast development. But it can be changed and architected, and you pull out pieces and you make it less monolithic and whatever, and it will work eventually. But so I had engineers who'd tell me that, and they were making incremental improvements, and then we'd hit this other wall, and it was. And then I had other, like some advisors saying, oh, you need to rewrite from scratch, and some, and others saying, never rewrite from scratch, that's a death march, you'll never get out from under it. And it was just like, Holy shit! I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what to do. How did you make the right calls here? Is it just kind of like you just have to go with something? You got you got to go with something, <laughs> and it it started to get better. So a huge breakthrough. So a lot of that was happening um, when I didn't even work there, and I took over. By the time I I became CEO, then Greg Pass, who became VP Engineering via an acquisition. Um, he was was our first leader of engineering who really knew. Um, how to break down the problem and, and tackle it for where we were at the time. Mm -hmm. And then things started getting incrementally better, but it was still, it was years until things were a lot better. And then um, it was just hiring more. I think when it comes to scaling, you have to get people with experience. It's, um, I mean, perhaps people from an academic perspective can, can solve these kind of problems by reading about how others have done it, but self-taught, developers cannot they mm -hmm. they generally not self-taught in general but self-taught without experience because mm -hmm. you the problems are just really really hard and we had a lot of those type of developers and then eventually we got uh, the right types of engineers and the right types of engineering leadership and lots and lots of hard work and it wasn't necessarily that it was just time too it wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't that the first guys couldn't have solved the problem eventually and some of them were there and contribute to that it was just once you get rolling down the hill and like 
your skis have fallen out from under you, then it's just going to take you a while to recover because it, the, it keeps accumulating. Sure. And every time we would, we could make a 50% jump or 100% jump in performance. Right. And it would be eaten up like that by right. demand. Right. User base is jumped by 100% exactly. by the time you make the performance. I mean, the use, our, our limit growing users, our bottleneck was our server response times. Mm -hmm. Anytime we made it faster, we'd get more users. Mm -hmm. Oh, like instantly. So it just is just a really hard problem. And they're still working on it. Now there's hundreds of people working on yeah. it. And I have no idea. I don't even understand the architecture these days. I wrote some code, <laughs> Twitter and other things very, very early on. And now I have no idea. So I'd, I should probably even stop talking about it. <laughs> I know so little about it. But it, it, I mean, I think the lesson for me was hire the right people. To, to solve the problem. People that have had experience scaling things, at, yeah. seeing things at scale. Yeah. Um, let's but, but don't, but if you, of course, it's the classic problem that had we designed it for scale originally, would it have been inflexible? Had we, you know, had we come up, would we have come up with a product? Yeah. Um, let's jump forward to, to Medium. Uh, I want to cover that for a few minutes before I let you go. Um, this is a reinventing Blogger in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your vision here and what, you know, clearly you've, you've been very successful. You could decide to go chill for a few years. Mm -hmm. You know, like, why, why jump back in with another startup? It must have had to been something that just kind of grabbed you. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder why I didn't do that. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> when I stepped away from Twitter, I, I went to Tahoe for a little while. And even or after a couple months, I was like, I, I craved. Get this isn't fun. Yeah I, yeah. I want intellectual and creative stimulation. And... There's just so much to do. And so I finally focused on Medium after helping start a lot of things under this, the obvious umbrella. And it being another publishing system because for three reasons. One is I kept being obsessed with this problem area. And uh, maybe at first, when I stepped away from Twitter, I wanted to do this, what became Medium. But I forced myself to take some time. Like, I'm, your mind's just stuck in a rut. Like, mm -hmm. take a break, you know, go start a hardware company or something, um, which I never seriously considered. But I thought, I need, I need to try and think of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did a bunch of prototyping. We <clears throat> helped incubate some companies and invest in a bunch of stuff. And that was fun. But I kept coming back to this area because, um, for one reason, I, I wanted to write more. I wanted to get back to blogging. And I went back to the tools that I use, and I thought, you know, it doesn't feel like these have evolved that much they in really the last haven't. decade. Yeah. And it also felt, felt like there's so much to do, not just from a technical and user experience perspective, but for the world. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of uh, people on the internet or in media have accepted, well, here's what the internet does to the publishing world or magazines or news. It just, it eliminates the economics that have supported quality <clears throat> throughout the ages, and therefore it's all going to go to shit. Mm -hmm. And so we live in a world of, of too much stuff, and it's all about faster, cheaper, how do, you, how do you throw something up back on the top of the stream before it disappears? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that is part of the reality today, but why can't we use the internet to actually do something better than ever existed before? Not just be the, a cheap substitute. And, and looking at this area and thinking about what the internet's great at, I think about things like collaboration mm -hmm. and how if you look at open source software or Wikipedia, the internet has helped people come together to create much better things than they can on their own. Mm -hmm. And then I go back to my blog and say, it's a pain in the ass even to get someone to proofread it. Mm -hmm. Like These mechanisms just aren't built in. And if you believe that people create better things together than they can on their own, then why doesn't that apply to this area? Mm -hmm. And all of social media, which has all kinds of good stuff, but it was, it's all about the individual creating something on their own, usually as easily as possible, and then getting like positive feedback from that. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a place for, for building bigger, richer things, telling deeper stories, uh, and people working together. And so it's, uh, that really, it, it felt both um, something that I could do, it'd be fun to work on, 
and that the world needed. And mm -hmm. it's funny because in the last year since we've been working on it, it seems like a lot of people, as, as usually happens, a lot of people realize the same thing and thought, we can move the ball way more forward on, in this area. And so a bunch, a bunch of other people are working on similar things, which is great, but um, that's, that's essentially it. And so and it's, there's ideas literally dating back to 2000 with, that we were prototyping in Blogger that we never got around to implementing mm -hmm. that we're building in a medium. And, the, it, and you know, all those years since. So the really big challenge has been boiling down these 15 years worth of ideas and observations to figuring out where to start. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's really fun. So I've noticed that you've recently started to get more into the kind of uh, collaborative space where someone mm -hmm. can like write an article, invite people and friends to proof it, things like right. that. Do you see that as being like, <clears throat> When I first saw that, I thought it was a pretty brilliant feature, and I thought because well, when you're creating a new entry, it's like this silo. You're mm -hmm. you're in there by yourself, mm -hmm. right? And you're you're typing it up, and no one else is looking mm -hmm. at it. It's like this like little secret right. until you click the publish button. Right. Like, do you do you see this eventually being a tool where, um, you know, uh, whether there's some type of uh, you know uprising someplace where multiple people can come together to creatively tell a story together, like. Yeah. You know, like how si sometimes like there's um, Wikipedia articles that spring up because something happens. There's yeah. a plane crash somewhere, and 15 different people come in and start contributing content. Yeah. Like, do you see that as being a way to create a better story, or it could? Though we're not specifically thinking about news at all, or a really crowd-based mm -hmm. creation. Um, what about collections of stories around a topic? Collections of stories, yeah, definitely, and that's our collection model is is to enable people to say like, oh, I have something to add on this topic, and the whole, everything we do is designed so the whole becomes greater than the sum of the parts, and part of that is the collections, part of it is uh, the notes feature, so when readers come along, they can actually add things instead of just this discussion at the bottom, mm -hmm. in the best case scenario, they can actually add things in context, and the author can decide if they're valuable, mm -hmm. maybe even update or change the article, mm -hmm. And the notes, or the collaboration, is eventually, um, we, right now, you, all you can do if, when you collaborate is add notes to what someone else is writing. So it's not a co-writing environment. But eventually what I would like that to do, it's really useful for very simple things like copy editing or, or feedback on the words. It's also useful to send to trusted friends. Like, I have this, we, we want to extend that so it's, it's it shortens the time or the writing is hard, right? So it's, it's mm -hmm. like we want to make it easier but also make the end product better. And I think collaboration leads to both of those things mm -hmm. is the theory. And it could be everything from give me feedback on this idea or find my typos to I need a photo for this or I need an example of this. You know, and, and do you bring the masses together to do that, or do you just bring maybe. in trusted friends? Right now it's trusted friends, but I'm really interested in extending that, and maybe maybe there's different levels. Maybe there's... Because um, it feels like you don't want everyone to see it, but you, don't you want, want a certain... Like, but you don't know who topic. necessarily right. can add value either. Right. So there, there's a whole bunch of area for the, us to explore there. It could, be, it could be groups, and certain people opt in. To to do it. I mean, we you've contributed to to one of the startup collections, and I I think it'd be really cool. There's maybe a dozen people in there. I think it'd be really cool if all those people had an option to if any of those people started writing something new, even if in the idea stage, mm -hmm. if any of those people had an option to to add something. It's like, oh, here's a pointer, or here's mm -hmm. an idea, or how do you merge that work? It could be it could be really cool if you yeah, did it the right way. There's a lot there's a lot to figure out, but. That's why I'm interested in, in exploring that area because it's just like, in the process of creating fundamentally changes too. It's less of a, I'm on stage. It's it's more satisfying. I mean, I think most people who are creative and want to tell stories are, you know, there's there's this level you can get to even if you're really skilled, where you know, doing it yourself is is fun and satisfying and really, though really hard, but doing it with other people and going to a whole new level in most professions, most creative professions, other, is, is even more satisfying. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to explore that in many ways. It's interesting to think about how, how do you prevent it 
from becoming mm. a back and forth dialogue and more into a cohesive one story. Because when you get multiple yeah. people involved, it seems like it turns into a yeah. dialogue about, well, this should be here, this should be there, versus yeah. like <clears throat> crafting a story yeah. together. So far, we've kept it very clearly owned by one person mm-hmm. and driven by one person to try and avoid that problem. Uh, it's possible, I mean, books and articles are multi-authored sometimes, and I think people kind of work it out amongst themselves. But right now, it's pretty simple because all it is is, I wrote this thing, give me feedback in the form of notes. My name is going to be at the top. Your name is going to be down here below. As a contributor. As, as like a thanks to. And we mm-hmm. kept it pretty vague even because we didn't want to make it so if my name was there, it meant I endorsed or agreed with everything there. But it's just, it's like these people gave feedback. Kind of like Paul Graham pushed at the bottom of his essays and other people, like these people read this before. Mm-hmm. Uh, we wanted to make that really easy and also give people a little bit extra incentive to actually give feedback. Mm-hmm. So right now, that's, that's pretty clear. Um, as we start pushing the boundaries, then credit and control and th- those things, will, we'll have to just figure out those issues. But mm-hmm. it's doable. Uh, when I visit the site today, it seems like a place to go to t- when you have an amazing story that you want mm-hmm. to get out there. Does this ever turn into a general purpose like blogging tool? Yeah, I mean, we don't call it blogging. What we definitely want to do is lower the formality of Mm -hmm. it. And this is a tricky area we're in because we definitely want to promote the best stuff and this amazing stuff, but we've heard from a lot of people that it's intimidating because it doesn't feel like I can just offer my casual thought or right. casual story. It has to be well You feel crafted. like you're submitting something for review yeah. by your peers and you get a little bit anxious. Exactly. And, and so we, we need to break down that. And I think that's, that's partially just a, a function of growth. Because there is crap on there. But <laughs> the, if, we, if we design it right, in general, that's not what people see. Certainly not when they go to the homepage. Mm-hmm. But... Um, we need to, I think as it gets bigger and bigger, people will understand there's all kinds of stuff on here. Mm-hmm. And, but the goal, again, isn't to get everyone talking about everything. It is, it is a little bit higher of a bar on purpose, and I'd rather have fewer authors and fewer posts that are seen by more people because they're the best ones than everybody chattering amongst themselves. Right. And so that's... That's important, but still, I don't think people should feel like they have to be writers because people have amazing stories and ideas who aren't right. writers, and everybody really knows how to write. And especially if if you, someone with an amazing story or idea or 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 their insight because they had a particular experience or have a particular job, I want those people writing, and not intimidated. And as, and so I want them to feel like it's it doesn't have to be professional. A and B with little help from their friends or the community they can look as smart as possible. Awesome. Well, I don't think I have any more questions. Last one though, but I actually do have one more. Um, how can people get into the, the site? Is it completely open now to the it's public? It's not quite completely open, but we're expanding it every day. I mean, you can go to medium.com, you can read. If you sign up, um, just there's a sign in with Twitter. You have to have a Twitter account. Um, then, then you'll be on the list. So mm-hmm. the, the, the actual secret for your, for your viewers is um, the more they, they read on the site and, and participate, the more likely they are oh, to be that's amazing. able, able that's, to write. You always have these little smart things that you do. That's awesome. Cool. Well, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure.